With the great cancelling of Russia, uh, treasury bills are no longer risk-free. Uh, ownership is no longer risk-free. If you are on the wrong side of the US, US government, they can cancel you, um, which also feels like a kind of geopolitical mistake. Um, we talked before about currency wars. It feels like we're heading into uh, a system of kind of three, like a, a system that's kind of going to split into three. The, the the dollar will still exist as a reserve currency. Uh, we we will see growth of the digital renminbi. And hopefully, we th- and, I, and something I've obviously bet on is that uh, Bitcoin is the life lifeboat that a lot of people consider that they they might use because they don't want to be stuck in one particular system. They want maybe a per- permissionless system. How are you kind of looking at this? Yeah, so I think that these events accelerate um, a multipolar reserve system. So I think that you know there were already signs of that happening. So Russia, for example, was already starting to price uh, its energy in more than one currency. Uh, we were seeing kind of uh, 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 more trade between India and Russia and China and Russia, uh, and and even like Russia and Europe. Was, you know, some of that was getting uh, euro denominated. Uh, more of their trade was euro denominated, and obviously this accelerates it, uh, where every country, especially ones that are not particularly friendly to the West, is probably reevaluating their reserve practices. The Wall Street Journal ran a piece called "If Russian Reserves Aren't Really Money, That the World's In for a Shock." Right. So in addition to the fact that that T-bills and euro bonds and all these things, uh, in addition to the fact that they pay interest rates, they're well below the inflation rate. So, you know, they're, they're undesirable as a long term store of value. Uh, now they can also be censored uh, and they always could be. And it's just now that now that there's more awareness uh, that those tools are willing to be used. And you could even do things like selective defaults. You could do things like freezing reserves. Uh, and so, in theory, that increases the desirability of, of reserves that can't be canceled. And so, the knee-jerk one is gold, because that's the one that central banks already own. It's already big and liquid, something like $12 trillion estimated market, uh, less volatile. And so that, you know, for example, the biggest chunk of Russian reserves that are not frozen are their gold reserves. Uh, and so you look around at the countries and think like, you know, if I, if I was running a country, I would think like, why why don't we have more gold than we have now, right? Compared to what we have in terms of dollars or euros uh, and things like that. So that that's number one. And then yes, the longer you look out in the future, the more attractive Bitcoin arguably becomes as a reserve asset. So right now at less than a trillion dollar market cap and as a rather volatile asset, it is challenging for them to put that into, into their reserves in, in very large amounts. I mean, you can have obviously smaller countries or smaller allocations to it. I think uh, it shows up first in things like sovereign wealth funds because you know, if you, if you define something as an investment, you get away with more volatility than if you define something as a reserve. So kind of by their nature, central bank reserves are supposed to be very conservative. So things like currencies or gold, uh, whereas sovereign wealth funds are you know they can they they buy things like equities, uh, even some central banks buy equities. But you know for the most part, you see equities folks in sovereign wealth funds, and so Bitcoin can start there. You know basically companies can buy Bitcoin related investments, uh, or they can buy Bitcoin. So these sovereign wealth funds, and then the bigger that Bitcoin gets, the more widely held it is, the the more liquidity that there is, the less volatility that there is, uh, the more central banks could start looking at that as a viable. Uh, neutral reserve asset because it, it kind of fixes two things for them. One, they have a, a an asset that can't be frozen by a, a unilateral third party. Uh, third party, and two, uh, they also can go around sanctions and they can have kind of uh, permissionless payments. Uh, and so that that is something that you'd think would become more attractive to countries around the world. 